yeah perfect yes, hi everyone uh, good morning good afternoon or good evening or night wherever you are um, thank you for joining this webinar uh, and today's webinar topic is a monitoring uh, kubernetes log with open distro for elastic search and efk architecture which is kibana and uh, fluent a bit so uh, as Anjali mentioned, my name is Musa Shirazi. I'm a senior consultant. Here is my email. If you have any question after the talk as well, or if you want to reach out and discuss any technologies, issues you're facing, uh, please feel free to send me an email or add me on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to uh, discuss that. So today's agenda, we are going to uh, give a bit of introduction of Kubernetes, what Kubernetes is. If you're not aware why, uh, uh, you would uh, use Kubernetes. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about what are the challenges uh, with monitoring Kubernetes uh, logs inside Kubernetes, like if the services are working, um, if you have a deployed services like you know anything like your microservices, Kafka, uh, how do you do you monitor it? Uh, we'll talk about intro, uh, a bit of introduction of Fluent Bit and the EFK architecture. Brief introduction of open distro for Elasticsearch uh, and deploy fluent bit on Kubernetes cluster. And then we will monitor a Kafka and Zookeeper logs using an Elasticsearch and fluent bit. This is just an example. It could be any application. Uh, so uh, with uh, the rise of microservices architecture, the containers are becoming a de facto standard for deployments of many type of applications. However, uh, when we deploy, uh, you know, uh, this container application, it is very important that it can become very cumbersome or difficult if you wanted to deploy uh, those container application into multiple machines. Okay, uh, and especially if you have distributed applications like Kafka um, or or Elasticsearch or any other uh, tools like SQL as well um, or your microservices. It could be difficult where you wanted to have them, uh, you know, the use of our microservices, but be able to also manage them, deploy them, um, bring the new services based on your traffic increase. Uh, and that's where, <clears throat> even though containers provide that image uh, facility where you can containerize your application and deploy it, but when it comes to the deployment of multiple machines, it becomes difficult. And this is where system like Kubernetes automate the deployment of container applications. So uh, what is Kubernetes? In fact, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating a deployment, scaling, and management of containerized application. Uh, this is an open source, as I mentioned, uh, and it was originally uh, designed in uh, by Google, and now it is maintained by Cloud Native a Foundation. The word Kubernetes come from Greek. What does that mean is pilot. Uh, in fact, uh, Kubernetes itself is also called an orchestration uh, platform uh, or system where it works as a pilot to control what uh, applications or containers are deployed in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, some of the key features of Kubernetes um, when it comes to it is that it has come from Google, obviously built on Google and it was open sources. Uh, the advantages are that you can auto scale the application, the container applications you deploy. Uh, it has a uh, advantage of self healing infrastructure um, and also uh, application life management. You can use this, uh, you know, mm, Initially, it was built for stateless applications. So for example, you've got a web service you want to deploy on 20 servers. Uh, you just um, deploy a config, tell the Kubernetes, deploy this specific application to 27, and it would do it. Uh, but now, uh, with the rise of uh, stateful applications like you know, DBs, messaging systems, uh, and log management tools, uh, it also have a rich uh, support for stateful applications as well. Uh, and then obviously uh, you got a concept of Kubernetes divided into multiple different uh, uh, section or you say, let's suppose you've got different environments so you can namespace it and uh, you know have your own environment running within a big uh, Kubernetes cluster itself. Um, 
basically from a perspective of uh, let's talk about some of the key concepts of kubernetes okay kubernetes is configured on a one or more nodes okay a node can be a physical or a virtual where the kubernetes is installed now uh, sometime a node is also called a worker node in fact worker a node in a kubernetes cluster is called a worker node uh, an application uh, container uh, which are basically are deployed on those worker node they are also called minion basically uh, these worker nodes uh, but uh, for example the question comes and this is what we were talking about we don't work on a one physical node right uh, because uh, we we are talking about kubernetes cluster um, and we want to know what uh, you know uh, if what if this particular node goes down as you can see this diagram we got microservices kafka sql uh, cassandra but they are all in a one physical uh, worker node what if you wanted to deploy on a multiple one because uh, you want to have a resiliency and that's where the concept come of a, a cluster uh, in fact uh, in kubernetes itself uh, a cluster is a set of worker nodes working together to achieve that uh, to deploy specific application uh, this way even if one node fails you have an application which is still accessible um, moreover uh, multiple uh, nodes do help on load sharing as well okay uh, so now the question arises you got those worker node uh, you've got these applications being deployed but as i said this is a orchestration tool or a orchestration system uh, you want to be able to make sure that uh, if the kafka goes down or a sql service goes down it is available and deployed on the other uh, worker node or you can move uh, you can create the new copies of a worker node and this is where uh, copies of the services you're deploying um, this is all done through um, uh, uh, another type of node which is called master node uh, so this is basically uh, deployed as part of the kubernetes cluster so you will have a worker nodes uh, which host all those pods and services uh, applications and then you have a master node which manages all those worker node and now it makes this so the master node is basically installed um, uh, it basically watches uh, the uh, over the nodes in a cluster and responsible for the actual orchestration uh, itself when we deploy on uh, on-prem kubernetes cluster we normally deploy that uh, master node separately and we do have access to it uh, but uh, when it comes to deploying the Kubernetes itself on uh, uh, like uh, on cloud providers like uh, EKS or JKE, uh, you, we, we don't normally have access to the master you nodes. This is all taken care by the cloud providers. But even I'm asked very lot of time, where is the master node when we deploy some Kubernetes cluster on the uh, on a cloud provider? It's normally we don't have access to it. Um, it's taken care by the cloud provider. But behind the scene, we do have master nodes which are managing it. It does have a component. I'm not going to go in detail due to the shortage of the time. Uh, but uh, we can go detail. There are different uh, components which take care of all this automation of those services or container. Uh, deployments uh, now let's talk about the concept this is another concept so we talked about master nodes worker nodes no no let's talk about what is uh, pods so as we discussed uh, before with kubernetes our ultimate aim is to deploy our application in a form of containers or on a set of uh, machine that are configured as a worker nodes. As you can see here, uh, we've got applications like Kafka, Bradis, and MySQL. Uh, however, one thing to note is that Kubernetes does not deploy containers directly, okay? So uh, uh, that is very important, that we don't deploy containers directly. Instead, uh, containers are encapsulated into uh, a small kubernetes object which is called pod okay uh, pod is basically a sin single instance of an application 
uh, and is the smallest object in the Kubernetes cluster. So it's always the pod which we deploy it. As you can see in this diagram, uh, we got um, a Kafka pod, uh, MySQL pod, Redis pod, and maybe it could be one of your internal applications which has been deployed. And then as you see, these are being replicated. And this is all taken care by the master node. So when we are deploying this application, we'll say, you deploy this particular application, deploy this th three times, four times, or five times, or whatever, how much of physical nodes you have it behind the Kubernetes cluster. And this is then all taken care by the Kubernetes. Now, one thing very important is that a pod can have multiple containers. This is to fulfill your ref uh, application requirement. Uh, I'll just give you a simple example. Maybe you have a microservice which is running a web server application where you could deploy um, a container as a front end and a back end uh, on a same application to fulfill your requirement. Uh, so they could be two multiple container and deployed in a single pod. But on the other side, you could deploy them as a separate pods as well, like, uh, you know, as you can see here um, on the on MySQL as a single container as well. Now, uh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, when it, so these are the concepts of the Kubernetes. I know this is very much like we, we just touched upon this, uh, but very important to know is that um, there's a lot of moving parts in, uh, in pieces in Kubernetes because all of a sudden you've got pause with uh, automation and since there is an automation you basically tend to let the master node take care of that uh, and so because of the dynamic nature logging can becomes a very challenging piece okay when i say dynamic you can tell um, there will be a possibility if for example this goes to pod goes down it can come and log in somewhere uh, i mean uh, it could come up on the other worker nodes itself so uh, so uh, so one of the thing is that let's suppose if there was a crash on one of those uh, pods uh, this will uh, what kubernetes will does is that it will move uh, this to another uh, worker node to make sure that there is something called desired state because as i said when you're deploying an application you tell I want this pod to be running five copies. So ultimate goal for a Kubernetes master node or Kubernetes cluster is if you have a five nodes or three nodes, depends on what is the physical infrastructure, it will try to make your five copies of those applications. So if, for example, if specific application crashes on one of those worker node, it will make sure it runs on the other side. And that's where the challenge come in. When you move from one worker node to another one or you add new services, how quickly you can manage and monitor that. This is not the similar old, old list scenarios where you deploy an application on a physical server or on a VM and then you deploy your monitoring and then you pick up those new uh, uh, logs. That's not the case with a Kubernetes world. Everything is dynamic. Everything is move, fast moving. And that's where you can, uh, you want to make sure that this challenge is taken care uh, with, uh, with the tools available so that you don't lose the monitoring. Because one of the very important thing in Kubernetes is to monitor your uh, in infrastructure very closely, especially logs as well, how they are behaving. Now, one thing is very important that Kubernetes does provide a native support for uh, logging itself. Uh, that's called kubectl logs as well. Uh, this is similar to get logs as well uh, from your application. Now, the only challenge basically becomes uh, with this is that the kubectl is similar to uh, you know Docker log. It does not have enough, um, for example, you cannot store for a longer period and it's quite challenging to deploy that. And it's not suitable for real time and uh, log monitoring for your operational team. And that's where we let's talk about uh, logging context. OK, uh, that's basically tell um, is what are those moving parts? So let's suppose if we were monitoring the logs in a Docker container, for example, just simple. Take an example where we were just deploying, you know, we just deployed a Docker container or send our application. And uh, what we will have it on that container uh, is just a pipeline and standard out, right? Docker logs you do, you get the logs put them in some specific inter, uh, you know a specific uh, location in your hard drive and you capture those logs from there and this is the only thing is that log will have from a 
from a Docker logs perspective, if it was a Docker logs perspective, you will literally have a log timestamp and a log message, right? Where is and which container is coming from. But on the other side, if we were doing this log logging in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, we do have, uh, you know, uh, uh, a logs can come from a specific container, but imagine, as I said, containers are not deployed directly. So container would then be a part of a specific pod, right? This pod might have a label uh, to identify which application is this related to. And as I said, these applications are distributed because these are distributed. This specific pod, we could have a similar pod in, on another physical node which is doing the same, um, you know, trying to solve the same uh, uh, prospect. Uh, so, for example, you have an engine a a application. Uh, even though uh, it's deployed in a different physical uh, uh, servers, it's the same application, okay? And they are deployed in a specific namespace. Uh, so, uh, all those information uh, is to basically becomes very important that you treat this as a logging context so you need not only literally looking for a log information in this log messages we are interested in all together what this context is related to a specific application uh, and that's where uh, you know um, it, it becomes very important that we don't uh, we do have log processing systems which can monitor those and provide that services or, or get that information for us, uh, okay? Uh, and obviously, as I said, the pods can have different replicas as well. So you wanna make sure that we monitor all those uh, pods wherever they are deployed as well, okay? So, so how uh, this work? Uh, so in Kubernetes, uh, you need to try to gather the whole context, not only the log message and the container ID, but you need a whole context. And what is that? You need a container name, a container ID, which is basically we were just talking, and then the pod name, pod name and pod ID, namespace, because namespace is a concept where you can deploy different, different. you can have a dev namespace and a production name. So, so this is the concept of the Kubernetes. Then uh, you can have uh, a physical node we were talking about where the worker nodes, where the pods are deployed, labels, uh, are very important to identify an application. Uh, just to give you an example, maybe you can deploy an application with different versioning so that your operational team can understand which type of application we've deployed and what the version number is there. So labels are very important uh, in the concept of Kubernetes. And that's where when you're monitoring it, log your logging process or, or, or whatever applications which is monitoring that should be able to gather that together and give you in one context to that uh, and that's where we need uh, uh, some kind of a log processor right so we talked about uh, you can get uh, the container and system information related to those containers from a journal d but on top uh, master service do also add extra information as i said pod id container id known labels and other stuff so in sense as a log message you are only uh, interested on everything through some sort of a log processor which can gather this and present in a very nice way and this is where uh, a log processor like fluent bit comes in okay uh, fluent bit is one of the log processor in the market if you search there are other ways to monitor uh, um, uh, kubernetes uh, logging other famous way is using a elastic infrastructure, which is called beats, um, uh, which is basically you can have file beat or metric beat, which can also work as a log processor. Uh, this is another open source uh, platform. We're not going to talk about this today, but uh, that's another way you can do. You can also use Logstash or a Fluent D. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what Fluent D is uh, in the next slide. So, what is uh, Fluent Bit? It's an open source uh, uh, platform, uh, which basically uh, uh, it's a, like open source. That's one of the best thing. Uh, and it is a multi-platform log processor and forwarder. Written in C, 
that means it is very low on memory and CPU utilization, very lightweight. This is the reason it was built on to be very lightweight because with Kubernetes moving part, you don't want to be having a log processor which is taking 40 or 50 MB of your, uh, of your memory because memory is also very expensive from a perspective of uh, um, uh, in a Kubernetes world uh, and does have a built-in support for TLS. That's another very big advantage. And it does have a support for uh, around 70 plugins. We'll talk about a uh, little bit about plugins. Now, if we take a difference, there is a no, another uh, open source tool, uh, which is uh, same company. Uh, I think it's Treasure Data it was started from. Uh, they started FluentD previous uh, as first. FluentD is also similar to FluentBit, uh, but uh, the one of the drawback from FluentD is that it was not built for Kubernetes to be on in mind. It was built for more standard monitoring as an alternative to log stash um, or uh, or similar to log stash, uh, where the the only difference is it's it has thousands of plugins, so it does support different type of uh, uh, types of applications. You can send syslog messages, TCP messages, uh, Kafka messages. Uh, there is a huge list of it. But the, one of the disadvantage of, for running that FluentD into Kubernetes cluster is the high memory um, utilization. And that's why it uses around 40 MB. On the other side, uh, FluentBit is written in C and has only where it consume only 650 kilobytes. So see, imagine how much of process, uh, you know, you save a memory. So this is basically where uh, FluentBit is becoming a de facto standard for monitoring Kubernetes uh, uh, logs itself. Now, uh, there are around 70 plugins, and I think it's enough for monitoring most of the Kubernetes application you, should, you deploy in. So let's talk a bit of uh, how it works from a FluentBit perspective, like what are the journey it takes to capture that logs. Uh, when I was talking about those context, log it cortex, the name and I was saying, uh, and then the type of, uh, you know, monitoring you're doing, type of logs you're picking it up, uh, how this generally go through in through the FluentBit uh, process. So FluentBit provides uh, something called input plugins. This is to gather information from different sources. Uh, some of them are collected using log file and other can be gathered as a matrix. Okay, so for example, uh, a metric CPU or memory can be one of those uh, input plugins can be used to monitor the CPU and memory utilization of that. Uh, log files is very well known where you could go and read the messages for from the log file. So there are different input plugins. I got that from their website. Um, when you click it, you'll be having a full list of uh, input plugin which are supported by the fluent bit. Okay, uh, so very important, uh, whatever you want to put data in, uh, you can uh, understand. You can look at it if the input plugin is supported uh, and you can get that. Now, uh, the next comes the parser inside the Fluent Bit Design. A parser is dealing, uh, basically the parser work is that, uh, imagine if you're putting a raw messages uh, uh, and unstructured messages, that can be very pain uh, to deal with if you don't have any way to enrich those uh, or idly to structure them in a way where you can understand it. So one of the example I give you is Apache log file, right? When you get an Apache log file, it does have a very rich information such as, uh, you know, Apache web server log I'm talking about. Uh, a one log file will have information like uh, which country a user is hitting from uh, or what, um, you know, browser information they are using it. Normally they are in one log file. And if you put in some, uh, uh, you know, tools like Elasticsearch or Splunk and everything, you want to, to convert them into a JSON format because JSON format make it more sense. Like you have a key and a value pair. So where you have a one log line, you will divide them into a multiple key and value, like country, the browser type, and the IP address, and things like that. So it makes lot sense to then do a searching and analysis and other stuff as well. 
So uh, this is where uh, the parser comes in. And then we comes the filter. So uh, in a production environment, obviously we want to have a control as well, right? Uh, we want to know uh, when we are monitoring logs from a front bit, we want to make sure that we can control what we want to put it because uh, it could be that you don't want to over utilize uh, or put uh, you have a storage requirement where you're only interested in a specific fields in a long messages or type of messages and that's where uh, you know the common thing come in there that's where the things like uh, filter comes in so you can enable those filters to uh, to configure and say, okay, I'm only interested in in this particular type of uh, log messages. So in this example, as you can see, we got a name and matches uh, a, a filter, a message type whenever we have cube dot star. So whenever a message has a cube dot star, it will go and filter and then process that to the next level. Okay. Uh, then we got a buffer. Buffer is basically um, is an ability for you in case. Uh, you know, um, kind of a persistent mechanism to store your data. So just in case if the out, uh, output, maybe you're sending to Elasticsearch or Kafka and it's some somehow there is a network delay or kind of a, uh, um, some sort of an issue. So you can basically uh, uh, enable the buffer to store some messages so instead of losing those messages if you're not able to send to the uh, to the destination uh, you can store that on a buffer uh, for for uh, for further processing later okay and uh, again uh, then comes the routing and this is very core feature of uh, uh, of uh, of fluent bit that allows you uh, is to based on all those information uh, where you want to uh, send this information to destination wise. So you could send on a multiple, um, depends on the inputs as well and even on the tags and match mechanism matching. So, so the router relies on two types, on a tag, which is basically a human form uh, readable thing so which we can enable that during when we are putting it on this section on input section that yeah, in this example if you see we name input of cpu and then we put my underscore cpu as a tag and then uh, there is another input which we might be receiving from another input source and we put it memory and we put it my underscore mem now we could have a multiple outputs as well so we can say that Whenever it matches my underscore CPU, send that to Elasticsearch. And whenever uh, you see a mem uh, message, you can send out to standard out. So, so it's a lot of flexibility from this mechanism uh, where we can then take care of that. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and then uh, comes the output section. This is very important as well. So from our output plugins, uh, you can send that to different uh, 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 services like Elasticsearch, FluentD, InfluxDB, Kafka, um, and HTTP, uh, Treasure Data, NATS, and other outputs are available uh, on uh, on the link below where you can go and look at it. Is that basically uh, uh, you know uh, where you can send this from the processing wise? Now, very important thing is now you've got a log processor, you've got a Kubernetes. Now we need an architecture uh, where to send those logs to. Okay, one as I talk about output wise, you've got InfluxDB and FluentD uh, or any static sticks. One is one of the architecture we use is something called Elasticsearch. So if you haven't heard about that, just give you a very very brief introduction what Elasticsearch is, and and how you can store those messages because in that its log processor is good to process those messages, but it needs to store somewhere for a storage. And that's where uh, a very important uh, and fam uh, famous architecture comes in called Elastic EFK. It used to be called, and it's still lots of companies use it, something called ELK, which is uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash in Kibana. And this particular uh, is uh, architecture is called EFK, which is mean Elasticsearch, uh, FluentD or BIT or Kibana. Now Elasticsearch is an open source platform, uh, which is basically is to uh, to store uh, different type of data. Uh, so it is it, it's built on Lucene, and you can uh, store and search 
terabytes of data very and uh, analyze it very fast and then uh, you use uh, fluentd or bit as we discussed to get this data into elasticsearch and kibana can be used to visualize those logs because Again, the logs can be important, but when you make them visualize it, it makes a lot more sense and makes a lot of value out of those. So this is what we call uh, an infrastructure. Similar to this is called a uh, look like uh, from uh, uh, from an architecture perspective. Uh, you will have fluent bit, for example, uh, capturing logs inside the Kubernetes cluster. It can then send to uh, a fluent D uh, or uh, as a common place, uh, it could also send directly to Elasticsearch as well, uh, but somewhere you could also put Fluentd and then push that data to uh, Elasticsearch. Once it is stored on multiple different node, Elasticsearch is a distributed application which can distribute your data and you can put terabytes of data into Elasticsearch and analyze it very quickly. And once the data is stored, we can then use Kibana to use connect which is a visualization tool to visualize those logs, as you can see in this screen. Now, we're gonna talk particularly about open distro for Elasticsearch. If you haven't heard about this, please feel free to search about this because this is something uh, is, an, is a pure Apache 2.0 license distribution uh, for Elasticsearch. It is um, provides uh, basically uh, enhanced features like security alerting SQL and all those features out of box without any charge okay so if you are using already another flavor which is uh, an elastic version of it you can search that and uh, look for it all those features where you might have to pay uh, a license fee uh, for features like last the security SQL um, uh, and uh, uh, other features, enterprise grade features with open distro for Elasticsearch, you don't have to pay for that. They are part of a free open source environment. This is backed by Amazon uh, and uh, gathering a lot of pace now uh, uh, by us. At Insta Cluster, we also use provide a managed platform where we can you can come to our um, website to our and to a console and we provide you an automation automated way to deploy a managed uh, Elasticsearch cluster, which is our back also our open distro for Elasticsearch. And we're going to deploy today the we to use the open distro for Elasticsearch and I'll show you um, it's similar to the other one. So basically this is uh, it from the presentation. I've got a live demo to show as well. How do you deploy that? Uh, so I just was wondering if you have any questions before we go and discuss that, uh, do a quick demo. So I do have a few questions. Okay, uh, I've got a question. It sounds like Fluent Bit is more like Elastic Beats and Fluent D is more like Log Stash. That's exactly, uh, you're right. Uh, that is true. Um, Fluent Bit is more like Elastic Beats, like File Beat, Metri Beat, and uh, the Fluent D uh, is compared to log stash exactly where you want to be able to do it now one thing to note is that fluent bit also have a support for the security uh, some of the beats i think there is a security features uh, available but if uh, you know some of them uh, where i've seen companies use fluent bit just pure that because it uses uh, built in security features as well okay uh, uh, other question is how Kubernetes is different from ECS pod and ECS won't allow access to logs directly for logging the ECS system directly instead of the through a way of Splunk. Uh, ECS, could you just, uh, Sunil, please elaborate what is that ECS uh, mean? Uh, then I can compare that what is ECS pod will be. Uh, I've got another question. Does EFK come with any pre-built uh, Kibana dashboard for Kubernetes monitoring? Uh, no, uh, they are not, uh, but you can build them. This is not as compared to when you use Fluent Bit, uh, where you can deploy them uh, using um, uh, basically 
does not come with it. And I'll show you, we can build that. It's a lot easier uh, from a perspective of uh, that. Uh, Elastic, Amazon Elastic Container Service is a highly scalable container management service. That's correct. So yes, correct, Sunil. Yes, oh, sorry, you were talking about the Amazon one. Uh, we are, um, uh, so we are going to deploy something called EKS, uh, which is, I think it's called Amazon Elastic container service, uh, EKS, they call it uh, EKS, which is basically a Kubernetes cluster service, which you can deploy uh, and automate uh, all those uh, deployment. And in fact, I am just going to use the EKS cluster and I'll just show you. Um, it's very simple and I'm going to deploy even all those services on EKS. Uh, do we have another question? Uh, so what is, deal with open lawsuit against the okay <laughs> that's basically the question uh, i don't see there is any problem because uh, uh, that lawsuits was something to do with the um, with the um, i think we can you can search that i it's still going on but i'm not sure because lots of companies have uh, they start using it and there has been a con clarification from those companies where it was against amazon has also confirmed that uh, so maybe google it i don't see there is any issue of not using open distro this is widely used now with lots of companies as well in fact uh, if you uh, e go uh, request for a, uh, an amazon cluster they use open distro for elastic search uh, so this is uh, this is how it is safe so they are providing their managed platform open distro for elastic search so it's definitely safe to use it there is no should be any concern about that uh, i think that's for the questions uh, so let's let's start the the demo then uh, and we will then um, uh, feel free to ask me more question i'll be happy to do it Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, uh, open what we called. Uh, we'll just uh, quickly show you what I am deploying it. So AWS, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to go to management console. Just one second. Just gonna take sure that we are on the, So as you can see, I've just deployed that, like I had already planned it because obviously because of the time, uh, I've got an EKS, Amazon Container Service. I think Sunil, you were talking about this one. Uh, this is basically is also called, uh, um, uh, in fact, EKS is for deploying the, um, the Kubernetes cluster. And if you can see here, uh, we got one cluster with three nodes. These are called worker nodes as I talk about. These are the physical compute, but on top of them, we're gonna deploy different services. So uh, the way to access is normally uh, the Kubernetes cluster is, if you look, cube, CTL, get pods. And as I said, pods is the, uh, the Thing, the smallest unit which can be deployed okay so uh, if i uh, look here uh, i can say first thing i can say is i want to see how many worker node i have it for the uh, for uh, in our kubernetes cluster so if i see kubernetes get kubectl got nodes that will give you uh, the number of physical nodes we have it okay and these are the worker nodes which we deploy okay uh, so we got one two three and this is exactly what i was showing it on this side uh, so and in sense if we look further uh even though it's on deployed on the kubernetes uh, like it's a kubernetes behind the scene it's a your ec2 instance is running but everything is automated so same thing if you can see here now uh Again, I'll show the get pods. Get pods shows me that I've got some some pods already running. Just to make it uh, save of time, I did deploy Open Distro for Elasticsearch already. Okay, uh, so it's got uh, three nodes of Open Distro for uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, that's basically um, when we say we want to deploy these uh, three copies. 
we just said um, and that was then taken care by last uh, by kubernetes to deploy it would have deployed that into a different physical nodes okay i do also have deployed a kafka as well uh, if you're interested how we can deploy kafka on kubernetes uh, if you search Kafka on Kubernetes, I think this is a second talk. Um, you come second on the list, it comes in on YouTube. I have given this talk very thoroughly, giving a full detail how you can deploy uh, Kafka on Kubernetes uh, very easy way as well. Uh, this is basically just showing that we have some certain applications up and running. We have a tool um, like Elasticsearch to monitor our logs, but we don't have any way to monitor anything at this moment right because we haven't deployed the fluent bit and this is what we're going to deploy it uh, just so that uh, i can show that uh, we have a service running if i uh, go and uh, access the local host uh, this shows that we have a kibana running and this is kibana uh, the kibana is a visualization tool you can use this tool to uh, visualize your logs and look out those logs so when we enable the logging today and uh, now i will show you you'll see that the logs will start to appear as we're going along okay so now uh, let's let's talk uh, how we can uh, deploy it now in order to deploy a fluent bit okay and we're going to so we got our last research running we have the services running. We need to deploy Fluent Bit in our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, very th important thing to note here is that uh, Fluent Bit can be deployed. Uh, you know, there is an instruction, and I've just used the same instructions uh, from their website uh, just to make it easy. I think it becomes a lot easier when someone explain it. But literally, I'm just I've come to their website, come to the manual. Uh, click on this Kubernetes, and these are all those configs that needs to be deployed. Now, what are those configs? Let's go one by one. So this is a service role, role binding, and service account. These are all the services which are required, uh, which is part of the requirement for Fluent Bit to run. So first configuration file is something called service account, which mean uh, it basically creates a service account inside of Kubernetes, which will allow it to make changes to the Kubernetes services, okay? Uh, which is basically we're saying you are allowed uh, as an application to make, uh, you do some certain things. What are those certain things uh, we're saying is that you need to be able to get the name, watch them and list. These are some sort of a rules um we do it it's similar to any roles you know your standard we will talk about and so basically we deploy this role then we deploy a role binding so normally in kubernetes uh, you always bind uh, these role with your service account so that they are able to do what uh, um, required what we mentioned in the roles then comes a very important thing which needs to be deployed uh, in uh, fluent bit is called uh, config map what config map tells you is as we talk about uh, is what is the configuration and what we want to monitor it as we talked about we have a kubernetes uh, input as uh, uh, that we want to be able to pick anything which is cube dot start Okay, and this is basically from a Kubernetes perspective. This is an input plugin because it understands that it needs to pick the logs from the Kubernetes. And this is an input.com file is there. Uh, and this is basically in selected on there. Then you got a filter where we're just saying anything where you see cube.star, just put them, uh, push them into the next section. And as you can see, the next section was uh, the output. And in output, you basically, we are sending to ES, which is Elasticsearch. Uh, very important that is that Fluent, uh, you need a username, password. And one is very important thing, uh, which you will spend maybe if you were deploying uh, your own, because it takes a lot of time. How, because Open Distro provides built-in security. And obviously you have environments where you deploy on a secure environment. You normally use something called TLS, and that is one of the more difficult parts. Are. So when you're deploying a fluent bit in your Kubernetes cluster to monitor and sending those logs to a secure Elasticsearch cluster, make sure that you provide this information. So you provide the TLS on, you then need to provide something called a root CA. 
okay i will then show you i'll show you how we can get this information uh, and then we are saying you just send it to the specific index okay uh, this is uh, just a config map and then one of the other important concepts to understand when you're deploying fluent bit is something called daemon set now you can search that in the google daemon set is a way uh, it's like a similar to a pod but instead of it deploying uh um based on the number of pods we required when say we say it is deployed automatically based on how many nodes you have it worker nodes you have it so as we talked about we have uh three nodes so it will deploy those uh into our um, cluster so this is basically and then it takes all those other information uh from a perspective of what is the username password but here is another important thing to note which uh, i have put this uh, is this configuration section right this is where it's saying that um, uh, we need to add a new path for the search because when a kubernetes pods will run because in in then it's an application uh, it just like runs inside the container it needs to look for any certificate which we need to provide and as we talk about in config map we were talking about a config map which then picks up the the certificates for the uh, elastic search because it needs to know so any certificates you have it you should be storing in this place now this is saying i'm mounting the path but it needs to know where to get this from and what we are getting it from is something called secrets so there is a concept in elast uh, uh, fluent uh, in uh, kubernetes where you can store your secrets inside the secret and that's what we will go through uh, now okay so this is something a configuration to go through uh, again when you will go hit exactly the same configuration we are deploying it by it makes sense when you have understanding why and what you're deploying it so um as i said i've got a resource folder if i see resource folder uh, i have uh, if you go to fluent bit and then we've got the same files here okay and this is one we are going to deploy one by one just to make it save the time i will deploy it very quickly uh, but this is we will see how quickly okay so uh, let's let's roll out quickly um, so first thing is if you do kubectl get service accounts you'll see there is nothing from a fluent bit perspective so i'm gonna quickly deploy that in there um, so if i now go and deploy it as i said uh, this is the same file uh, this is what i have deployed now and if i do kubectl get service account you should see a fluent bit being added okay so that's first step always uh, this next step is deploying our role uh, basically a role is basically tells you so if you want to see uh, what roles is as we lock um, i'm just deploying the same file which talked about we're saying that deploy a role and uh, with a get and list so just copy and then you deploy the role okay uh, next step is basically you want to deploy a something called role binding which we talked about that we created a service account now we created the role we want to bind them together okay uh, copy that and then we just deploy a role binding okay okay one thing now before i deploy a daemon set it is very important that i i show you a step of how to get the certificate for the from the uh, from the elastic search because this is where uh, we want to be able to uh, see it so how do i get the certificate of open distro elastic search if i do get pods uh, pick one of the application and this is one of those applications right uh, which basically uh, can be uh, do it so what i can do is basically is if i go to resource files do certificate folder and currently there is nothing if i do ls there is nothing and if i do uh, what i'm going to do is now if i see cube ctl get pods uh, we've got now this elastic search elastic node this is one of the nodes for elastic search if you are using elastic search in the uh, in in your production or services you would know that what i'm going to do is just copy this 
and I'm gonna uh, put something called so this is one of the command which can be used to exit so what we're doing is we are using a kubectl exit into this kubernetes uh, pod we are going inside the container because in the sense pod is just running some container right and then we're saying that go to this folder and copy whatever you root ca you have it and put that into uh, into our folder if i run it and do ls now we've got the root CA for this. This is a very, very important uh, step to, uh, to get the root CA. Now what we do is then uh, we do put that into a secret. And if you do get secrets, you will have different secrets, but you don't have a secret to copy this root CA. So all I do is uh, there is another command called kubectl create secret generic ESCA, which is basically the name of the secret. I want to put that into Kubernetes secrets. And what I want to use is the PEM file. Okay. Click on this, clear this. If I do kubectl get secret, you should now have a CA, which has been just added. Okay. So if we can, if you want to see what is that, if you do kubectl describe, it gives you that we got a PEM. And this is a file which will allow us, which we talked about in the config section, uh, will allow us to access the uh, logs. Uh, so now, if I go back, okay, clear that. Um, okay. So <clears throat> as I said, uh, I just want to do a cat for the uh, pa, 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 pa. yes. So we're going to do the role binding now. And I'm going to uh, do a, so we install the role binding. Now we need to deploy this role map, right? And then this was the config map as I talked about. Uh, this was the file which we are talking is interested, fluent bit is interested in. So when you are saying is that when you're going and out and discussing, going to send your logs to Elasticsearch, you want to make sure that you provide your CA information, the root CA, which Elasticsearch can accept it because this is the CA from the uh, file from the Elasticsearch. Okay. Uh, then uh, you basically go, all we do is deploy this into so we just uh, got this file because this is a config file we deployed it and next step is very important is to deploy a daemon set okay uh, a daemon set which i've just shown that as well is literally the same configuration which i was showing on the uh, visual studio the username password and uh, other stuff as well just so that you see that if i see get pods now Currently, nothing is there. Okay. As soon as I'm going to deploy a daemon set, so that is kubectl, uh, the file of the daemon set. Okay. I should see now that Kubernetes will deploy something called daemon set. And now, if I do kubectl get pods, you see that we've created a three pods or three daemon sets. These are, as I said, are related to how many worker nodes you have it. Okay. So if you have five worker nodes, this would have deployed five worker, five pods. This is basically each daemon set is taking care of one of the nodes from there. Okay. So now, as soon as we have deployed this log processor, we had the log stash, uh, sorry, the uh, open distro for Elasticsearch up and running, right? We needed to monitor the Kafka logs, right? One idea is if I see kubectl uh, logs and uh, you copy this um, and copy and there's this, right? This is how you get the logs and see how difficult it is to look at it because you can go up to a certain point and then you lose everything, right? Because this is a thing. Uh, and that's where now uh, I'm going to now, because now we're sending this to Elasticsearch and we should be able to see this now on Kibana because now Kibana, 
uh, is getting those logs okay so just to elaborate uh, what we've done is this uh, is that we have literally created the fluent bit daemon sets putting these logs we are running the kafka now we didn't do deployed fluent bit d in this case but we are putting now in elastic such the logs have started going in and now we want to see them visualize them on the kibana so now if i go to index pattern uh, if the demo gods are happy with me i should have some logs coming in and that's it uh, even though it names it with the log stash this is a way of how uh, uh, fluent bit installed by default because we didn't do much changes but you can name change the name <clears throat> to any index now what is index it's a concept of deploying it's like similar to a table in, in databases where you can use something documents i'm not going too much detail about what the elastic indexes are but once you add this all of a sudden now you've got those logs okay but the advantage is that now these logs are coming and you can refresh it so you can say okay give me the logs for last one hour since we are not running for see we can have a log now for last one hour and straight away we will start to see those logs coming from elastic search uh, to elastic search okay i want to now see kafka logs i search on it and we can have a kafka logs searched against that and now if i see here we got a kafka log then you can do a lot more further things right you can say okay i'm now interested only where my cluster uh, uh where i'm only interested in a particular uh type of thing where we i'm interested to look only the logs for the pod name right so i can say okay i'm interested in pod name and i just say that so now if i uh, click on this i'm filtering all those on the kibana and you can see now only see i see is a logs from there and how quickly we can do it i can do the other way as well so i say okay i don't want to see anything related to zookeeper right give me everything which is not the zookeeper so you plus that you see all those other logs as well okay so uh, i think i'm just four minutes out of the time but just wanted to make sure that uh, you know uh, how you can do it and obviously one thing i just want to say is that we can visualize that as well so i'll do a quick visualization just so that see how how quickly we can see we can create something called a uh, tag cloud right so we say i want to create a tag cloud where i want to count what is which particular uh, pod in my environment is creating more of the logs right so i say pod name this is something called term aggregation we can do if i now say okay give me everything of that 10 now update it and here you go so in in this particular last one hour i have seen that the zookeeper has created most of the logs okay and we can go further and create the logs related to it so when we click on it it only searches those logs so you could have a table where you only see those logs from there so literally uh within few uh half an hour we have managed to build our full monitoring solution where we can monitor kafka and elastic uh, using elastic search and fluent bit and it becomes very powerful from that perspective so yeah that is it for today uh i hope it was useful and you have any question i'm happy to answer thank you musa any questions okay. i think people ask most of the questions during the presentation but yeah. uh, you know you have shared your yeah there's one more question i think yeah musa do you uh, want to take that uh does fluent bit support uh elastic common schema uh not as such as what it does uh as compared to if you're talking about from a perspective of uh beach not but it might be coming you know because uh, obviously uh, one of the beats uh, beaches most of the data normally companies i see use fluent bit to send data to elastic search